the greatest Japanese composer of all time. I actually shunned Japanese music early in his career, and he was also almost entirely self-taught. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Toru Takamitsu. Takamitsu was born in Tokyo in 1930, but spent the first eight years of his life living in a northern Chinese province just across the Yellow Sea from the Korean Peninsula. By 1938, he was back in his homeland, and in 1944, just barely a teenager, he was conscripted into the armed forces. As the war in the Pacific was inching ever closer to its atomic conclusion, Takamitsu and his fellow young draftees were forced into building outposts in the mountains west of Tokyo. Ironically, doing so is what got him into Western music in the first place, even though it was illegal in the brutal nationalistic dictatorship to listen to non-patriotic Japanese pieces, they did so anyway, on a gramophone they constructed that included a bamboo needle. And they were able to get away with this because their immediate superior officer looked the other way. After all, he wasn't that much older than these teenage boys he was commanding. Takamitsu fell ill after the war and was hospitalized, and he used his free time while bedridden to listen to as much Western music as he could get his ears on. At age 16, he began writing music, having had no formal training at all. But when he did so, he felt like that was his life's calling, that his entire ambition was laid clear before his eyes. A fog had been lifted, as it were. He used every opportunity he had to play as much of the piano as he was able to get his hands on. And from then on, before he would start a piece, he would play bits of Bach's St. Matthew Passion to cleanse the soul, as it were. Now, a lot of self-taught composers are really hampered by not knowing the nuts and bolts of the process, and having to rederive these things from trial and error just takes a lot longer. It was Takamitsu's creativity that helped him connect the same dots as other musicians around the world were doing at the same time. In fact, while electronic music was being pioneered in Europe, Takamitsu was coming up with the same concept, even though he lacked the means to actually realize this idea. Takamitsu founded what he called the Experimental Workshop, which embraced tons of different artistic expressions, provided that said artistic expressions did not include traditional Japanese forms. Now, it's unfair to say that Takamitsu was entirely self-taught. He did receive some lessons in 1948, and then later on in the early 50s, and it's through these latter lessons that he became interested in writing film scores. Takamitsu's film scores constitute some of his most immediately accessible work, even if they don't have the kind of exoticism and color palettes that his concert pieces have. Stylistically, these film scores allowed Takamitsu to prove that he wasn't just some kind of one-trick pony. They really allowed him to showcase the breadth of his talent as a composer. He ended up scoring nearly a hundred films in total. Early on, this was due to monetary reasons, but once he became more and more on his feet, financially speaking, he did so just because he loved scoring films. I mean, this is a guy who actually, on average, went to nearly a film per day. Those who listen to Takamitsu's pieces often hear something distinctly Japanese about his work. But for the first few decades of his life, he sought to completely avoid Japanese influences. For him, for the longest time, traditional Japanese music was associated with the brutal dictatorship that brought about World War II, right to his doorstep as a young teenager, and that really affected him for a very long time. He even destroyed a set of pieces that he wrote when he was 17 because he realized that he'd accidentally included a traditional scale. Anyway, in the 1950s, Takamitsu was not really a known composer, but Igor Stravinsky came to town and in 1958 heard, completely by accident, a recording of Takamitsu's Requiem for String Orchestra. While the audio engineers were aghast that they'd played the wrong piece for this great composer, Stravinsky insisted on listening to the recording to the end, and thereafter invited Takamitsu for lunch. Takamitsu was blown away and humbled by the kinds of compliments that Stravinsky paid his work. And after Stravinsky returned to the United States, sure enough, commissions from United States orchestras started coming in to Takamitsu. Takamitsu remained staunch in his commitment to absorbing as much new music as possible, and it was pretty much impossible to do that in that era and never come into contact with John Cage. It was Cage, a noted Zen Buddhist, that led Takamitsu back to the sounds of his homeland. Takamitsu's flirtation with indeterminacy and graphic scores, real hallmarks of Cage's work, 
did not last, but what did stick was an embrace of non-Western instrumentation as well as the important use of silence as a functional musical tool. Whatever understandably self-imposed mental block he had against his own culture's music was now lifted. The lightness and the breadth of Takamitsu's music has a specifically Japanese word associated with it, ma. Now, this is one of those untranslatable words that means something like a void that isn't a void, or the idea that the absence of something can itself be a tangible object. This is very similar to Debussy's quote that music was the space between the notes, and considering that Debussy was highly inspired by Japanese visual art, there could very well easily be a connection there. Unfortunately, the Japanese musical tradition in the post-war era had dwindled to a minimum. It's unfair to characterize Takamitsu's music as a driving force behind the revival of traditional instrumental practices, but he did write a number of pieces for traditional Japanese instruments or traditional Japanese instruments in combination with Western ensembles. The combination of these different sounds and different cultural contexts was a massive struggle for Takamitsu, and he was about to give up on the process entirely when he realized that he wasn't supposed to necessarily integrate the Japanese and the Western. Rather, it would be effective just to place them in juxtaposition to one another. On an entirely different level, Takamitsu had to grapple with the idea of actually notating these instruments, instruments that had theretofore never seen any notation on a standard Western five-line staff. Eventually, instead of the juxtaposition on which he had to rely, he was able to find a way of integrating these things. But the process led him to a new musical direction inspired by traditional Japanese practices as much as figures like Debussy and Cage. He abandoned all preconceived notions of Western formal architecture in favor of a kind of stream-of-consciousness style. At the same time, he was still very much involved with the Western avant-garde, which thought of him very highly. And this involvement led him to write many pieces that are his most orally and instrumentally challenging, because he wanted to write for the best performers, and really push those best performers to their limits, which was a common thread amongst the avant-garde of the time. When writing for larger ensembles, he became very interested in the superimposition of Japanese modes and their derivatives into a Western context. Across many pieces, some of the same motivic ideas can be heard, simply respun and recontextualized as something totally different. One of the great things about listening to a Takamitsu orchestral piece is that he has such a finely tuned ear when it comes to color. Personally, I'd rank Takamitsu amongst the best orchestrators of all time. Takamitsu actually held Brahms in high esteem as an orchestrator, which is odd because as great of a composer as Brahms is, he really isn't known for really superb orchestration. But it, whatever works. While Takamitsu's music can be very dissonant, because he's filtering it through the language of Japanese modality, and he's really spacing things out well and has that kind of ear, his music really doesn't have the kind of crunch that's associated with highly dissonant music. Eventually, this would lead to the sound that would characterize his late works, something very similar to what Georgi Ligeti called non-atonality. In essence, Takamitsu was free to reference bits of tonal harmony, but he never used these in what we would call a functional way. In fact, this is something that also can be traced back to Debussy. Takamitsu passed away from complications of bladder cancer in February of 1996. The music world suffered a great loss, for Takamitsu was the first Japanese composer to gain any sort of acclaim in the Western musical canon, and he paved the way for others. War had once come between composer and culture, but later on in his life, Takamitsu became a staunch advocate for the unity of humanity. He sought maximum freedom of expression, and he wanted his Japanese heritage to be a part of that. He didn't want folk music of his homeland to simply be consigned to basically museum status. He wanted it not to be a part of the past, but part of the present. Speaking of the present, he wasn't above embracing popular music either. A set of guitar pieces from 1977 actually quotes passages from the Beatles. His self-taught nature meant that he had a certain disdain for the rules of music. In fact, he called such rules trite and stifling. His desire for freedom of expression meant that composers such as Debussy or Olivier Messiaen were of a much higher influence than, say, that of the Second Viennese School. Takamitsu didn't just throw Webern and Schoenberg out the window, though, but he came to regard their music as something more intellectual than the kind of sensuality that he was after. The first time Takamitsu and Messiaen met, 
I actually ended up with Messiaen playing his quartet for the end of time at the piano. And thereafter, Messiaen was just such an influence on Takamitsu that Takamitsu would often quote Messiaen directly in his music. With permission, of course. Takamitsu's final piano piece, entitled Rain Tree Sketch 2, is actually written as an homage to his late friend. <laughs> 